So our first presentation of the morning is going to be Alex Carmona uh, and his X1000 um, hybrid. Uh, and uh, so he'll explain the hybrid part and we'll have a microphone for him sometime in the future, probably 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, check one, yeah, that's good. That, that'll work. So we've got Alex's microphone on its way. In the meantime, thanks for the feedback for those who have given it about the third day. What's appearing so far is uh, people are saying, well, let's turn Friday into an extended classic clinic with classic presentations of new things for the classic platform. Uh, so that's what we've gotten so far. If uh, that's what you would like to see, please tell me. If not, please tell me what you would like to see. Uh, because that's what we want to do, is do things you want to do. Uh, and um, take advantage of the travel for the people who have traveled such a long way. We have people here from New Zealand and Britain and Canada and uh, Germany and uh, hopefully next year Belgium. Give me feedback on that, Daniel? On, uh, from uh, the other people? Yeah, about whether we should announce that. Should we announce their intention to come next year? Oh, okay, thank you. thank you. That's what I was curious about. So I didn't name them. Okay. Uh, okay, so Alex is on the channel. So Alex Carmona, thanks for bringing your, uh, your stuff to show. Okay, so um, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll do that. Um, okay, so today I want to show a couple of things. Um, one is just a cooling system I came up with uh, for the friendly computer review. Really. And the other one is all the things we can do with the Amiga. It's not X1000 specific, it's just for, uh, gen generally speaking, just the Amiga operating system. Um, but there's a lot of stuff we can do that nobody seems to ever talk about, so I'm assuming very few people do this thing. Um, but first, I'd like to cover the cooling system because that, that took me so much work to, to make it happen that um, I kind of wanted to share what I, I did in mind. Um, so where I live, there, there's a lot of dust. It's like so dusty that every two weeks I have to clean the inside of the computer or the, the heat sink gets completely clogged. So I, I just I got so tired of the dust, I was trying to figure out a way to keep the, the case completely sealed. And I, I decided to go with the Peltier uh, cooling elements because the, they basically uh, pull the heat from the inside, go through transistor and and release a lot of heat on the outside. So as long as you blow the heat out from the um, the back of the computer, it will basically uh, stays cold on the other side. And uh, so that's why I made that case originally is to have a, a way to um, basically sit inside and, uh, and also have a, a custom setup for the Peltier. Um, I don't know if you can really see it from there, but you can come afterwards and. Uh, uh, it's basically two heat sinks sandwiching um, a, a flat white plate that is filled with little transistors. And when you apply power to it, one side gets really cold and one side gets really hot. And, um, and so you, as long as you get rid of the heat, the other side stays really cold. Um, a lot of people were uh, asking me about condensation and if I wasn't going to drip on the computer or, or anything. But I found that as long as you keep the inside temperature around like 70, 72, it's fine. It's only if you cool it down to like 60 degrees, then it starts to gather like condensation from the air. And, uh, and then if you turn it off, it starts to like break. But the other thing is, you, if you really seal the case completely, you can actually put um, like dehumidifier okay. packets inside. And then once that, that moisture has been trapped, it doesn't matter if you freeze the air. Um, but it has to be really safe. Um, so yeah, the, the cooling system is controlled by a little ESP32. It's, um, 
it's like a really neat little microcontroller. And um, I like this thing because they have serial ports so you can interface with the Amiga. And, and so it runs autonomously, like it, it doesn't really need the uh, Amiga to do its job. But I can change the settings from the Amiga. So I just wrote some software that um, goes in there. It's uh, just the minimum required to be able to control a little screen and, and then um, basically control the, uh, the cooler. Um, and then the, uh, the ESP32 goes to a, a motor controller which was never meant to control a Peltier, but it turned out that these are perfect for controlling Peltier because they let you send uh, very fast pulses at like 20,000 uh, hertz. And Peltiers don't like to be turned on and off because they get hot, they get cold, and it creates stress, and eventually they break. But if you do it at that frequency, it doesn't break. It, it just so that's to control how much cooling you want to put without really uh, causing failure. Um, but the controllers were meant for driving a big motor from a little microcontroller, so you can send a little pulse at 5 volts or 3 volts, and it translated to a 12 volt pulse at up to this one 15 amps, but uh, uh, which is enough for that Peltier. Um, now the Peltier is not very energy efficient, so if you're trying to save energy, that's not the way to go because it consumes up to, at four, four power, it's 144 watts just to cool down the machine. So that's kind of not really, for general use, it's probably not the best thing to do. But if you have an environment where it's really dusty or just bad for the computer, that's kind of the best solution. Um, to just not have any uh, interaction with the air. And, um, that's pretty much it for the pet series. Um, there's probably more to say about it, but I don't focus more on the Amiga. <laughs> so, I, I'm not into serial ports. Um, I think USB is just horrible. It's convenient because you have the same plug, you just plug everything into the same kind of jack. But um, it, it requires very uh, complicated drivers. You have to pay a license to make USB chips. It's, it's just not uh, maker friendly. You can't really make your own USB chip. Uh, with serial, it's straightforward. Everything's documented. It works. It, it doesn't require the CPU to do its job. Um, so there's no need for polling. It can use interrupts. Um, if you fully utilize uh, serial lines, there's a lot of possibilities because of the, the ring line, uh, ready to sell all that stuff. So I just like the serial lines I've been. Last year I kind of explained that I basically upgraded the driver for OS 4 so it can support a large number of serial cards. So you can just plug any PCI or PCI Express card as long as it's following the standard um, um, it's, I don't know what it protocol. Yeah, the, whatever is the, the standard for RS-232. And, um, and it should work out of the box, should, because it doesn't always do that. But, um, but so basically now I can have as many serial ports as I want. So in this one I put like 12, I think, which is more than enough. And then, because they use a higher voltage than all the microcontroller, I usually I use these little um, here, um, ser um, serial to TTL, RS-232 level to TTL level, so that they basically bring the voltage down to either 5 or 3 volt, depending on how you set it. And and uh, some of them are little connectors, so you can just power them through USB, or you could power it, power it from the device. Uh, it goes both ways. Either you bring power on the pins and it powers the chip, or you bring power to the plug and it will power the device, which is how you do it. So you're saying that the serial on the, on the motherboard is too low voltage? Too high. Or too high. So yeah. then why do you need to put power on that? Uh, to lower the voltage to the microcontrollers like the Arduinos and these okay. things. Okay. Because they work at 5 or 3.3 three And volts. that's what, 12? That's 12 up to 18, I think. Okay. Um, that's it. Sometimes it's 9, sometimes it's 12. But I don't remember, but the standard can go pretty high. So you can cover very distances. Um, but so, yeah, so I use that. And, uh, and I, I like to play with the Arduino, so I, I basically, um, what I use on the Arduino is the um, uh, Bitlash scripting, um, 
in order for discover a command line scripting uh, program. So you can use all the Arduino libraries to control a specialized hardware, but you can actually write scripts, you can interact with the Arduino, and you can create your own functions which give you direct access to those Arduino libraries. And, um, and that way I'm able to uh, basically just pretty much do everything that the Arduino can do, but from the shell, from the media side. And uh, here you can't really see the screen, but uh, on, uh, on, on one of the, the windows, I'm, I'm basically getting the, uh, uh, all the access to these. So each one of these requires a separate driver, is uh, LED and LCD screens. And uh, so the Arduino side deals with the driver, and then Vintage, which is the scripting engine, gives me, I wrote new commands that give me access to those functions. If I can change the text, I hope it works, because last year it wasn't. Uh, thank you. Okay, so let's see here at the media again. Um, Yeah, so this time it works, but so I, I can display any message I want. Uh, ideally, I want to basically show the uh, the temperature inside the CPU load, if I have emails, if I have um, anything that needs my attention, or uh, the time, any information that's useful, basically. And uh, so you, you can control all kinds of displays, uh, regular little full-color LCDs, those uh, typical two and four line ones, and I like the dot matrix one, especially for clocks, because it's easy to read from far away. Um, and so on the, um, actually on the ESP32, because this is a really powerful little microcontroller, it has um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, two cores, and they run at 1.2 gigahertz. Um, so it, it, it's very capable. So on this one I put free RTOS um, and then um, I, I run Lua on top of it and Lua is a scripting language, there's a version for the media and it's, uh, it's a bit hard to run at first but it's actually event driven so when something happens and your subroutine just uh, does its thing so it's perfect for things that have pins because whenever the state of the pin changes you can make it do something and again, it's fully interactive with the media, so you can have a, um, like, say, a serial terminal that looks for specific strings and then does things on the media. Um, and the possibilities are like, endless. And so that's one of the things I do with uh, the serial port. Another thing that I, I couldn't get working today, but uh, is I'm actually uh, trying to uh, get voice command working with all the different voice command devices that exist and they all have serial um, outputs so there's devices ranging from like 12 dollars that actually do a really decent voice recognition to the more expensive ones like this one which was a kickstarter that was maybe 90 dollars but it's a it's a arm uh, board so it, it runs its own version of linux and it, it's it can recognize at least 500 different words. Uh, I've managed to get it to uh, successfully deal with uh, 500 different words. And then you, you run, um, you write your own software for it to deal with the input. And I, I was trying to make a calculator for the brain, but I wanted to make a, a, a scientific calculator because I, I didn't want to limit that to 2 plus 2. And it turned out to be really a big challenge because of the way people uh, same numbers, like 1,256, so I never finished it, I'm sorry <laughs> for the, all the bad people, but I will finish it. You know. So the problem wasn't the serial or the voice recognition, no, it was time. It, yeah, it was the complexity of the code to keep things from getting out of hand with if, then, or because um, there's a lot of possibilities, conditions, and and you still have to keep the code fairly small because it, it runs on top of the Arduino. Um, I, I might be able to, in, in some ways, to connect it to a more powerful Arduino compatible, but I, I didn't try that. Um, the other thing that um, 
I wanted to talk about is a 3D printer um, because I recently got this one. I was really curious about 3D printing, and when I found that for 200 bucks you can get a 3D printer with a laser engraver and cover, it's not a very strong laser, but it still does uh, some stuff. So I figured out well, to learn about 3D printing, 200 bucks is not a big risk to take. And then it turned out that inside of these things, I actually put uh, Arduino Mega. So it basically has a serial input. Um, and and then I, uh, that one is, it's, a, it's one of the best that I've found online. It's called the uh, uh, Super Helper. It's made by uh, Wingo, W-I-N-B-O. And these guys, they make giant 3D printers that print furniture. So they, they kind of know what they're doing and they put all their knowledge in that tiny little thing that's so cheap. It's actually a really, really good quality 3D printer. And um, it lets you print objects about, let's see with the head, about this big, like, um, which is pretty big for a cheap printer. But they use um, uh, all the standards, so the language used by 3D printer is called G-Code. Uh, it's very standard for routers and other industrial equipment. Um, and, uh, and so it's a text format that you can, um, literally you can type the commands from a serial terminal and just send it straight to the 3D printer and move the head, dispense the plastics, or turn the laser on. So you can, you can write a script. And um, the other thing you can do that I couldn't get working because the, um, I didn't want to open up the printer. Uh, to access the serial port, there was too much uh, unscrewing to do by that. Uh, the other thing you can do is from Blender, you can export STL files and, um, and then convert those STL files into G code. And then you can just feed that G code to the printer and, and get it to print whatever you made in Blender, assuming the shapes are printable. Um, so this is like a, a great uh, way to get started with 3D printing and it's, it actually can be done directly on the Amiga with no PC, no, no other device, which is what I always try to do. Um, the, uh, the Arduino on the other hand, for a lot of stuff like adding the libraries, you have to use uh, either Android, Mac or PC because you don't have an ARM compiler on the Amiga to compile the Arduino code yet. Um, then the other thing I want to talk about is the web cameras. Um, these are like pretty cheap now, like 15 or 12 dollars. Remote control, it's got Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Uh, it can run a decent amount of time on the battery too, with like an external uh, phone charger. And um, that's another camera that needs a 12 volt uh, plug and it's got Ethernet only. And these are IP cameras, so that's a way to do video capture on the Amiga. They do 1080, but they're really cheap, and some have really good sensors. This is a Sony sensor, and it sees in almost complete darkness without projecting any infrared light. It's just a super sensitive sensor with a zoom, focus, everything. Uh, it was like maybe 12 or 15 on Amazon. I don't know the brand, but. Um, if you look at the shape, you might be able to find the same name. And, and these are pretty easy to, to use because they basically output a screen like um, RTSP or R R So you can play it in M player. Right, so in M player, you just type the IP address of the webcam and you get the 1080 stream. And in this case, you also get the audio. So you could basically do video uh, chatting with a friend somewhere else. Um, by letting them tap onto the, uh, the video stream. So we don't have Skype and that, but we can actually use this with nothing more than the new guy. Uh, so that's one way to do video capture and stuff. Uh, I don't really have to remote control the, the models on the camera. I'm sure there's a way because it's all through the uh, network, but it takes time to uh, figure that out. And Let's see, is there anything else about that one that I haven't covered? Um, well, I guess that's it for now. If you have questions, of course, you can ask. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to just maybe show this. I think I showed it last year, but that's pretty cool. I can actually lock the uh, output of the, uh, the multimeter, like whichever setting it is, it will just lock the um, 
the value in real time about once per second. I can go twice per second, but that kind of multimeter that has a serial output, we can log that through. And that can be handy in some situation. We can measure it a lot of stuff. Um, so that's it. So what, you should probably repeat the question so everybody can hear. Okay. What sort of things have you printed? Um, I printed um, bracelets. Repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so the question was what sort of things did I print in this way you print? It? So I printed bracelets for my friend. I had to learn how to do things, so it was the perfect uh, motivation. And then I also printed uh, an adapter for my pen in the back of the computer, because the fence is too big for the heat sink, so I made a little um, shroud. Is it shroud? Bracket. Bracket uh, to force the air to go through the, the heat sink. Could you bring up the model and show us what the model looked like in black? Um, I don't have it here. Uh, maybe, but I don't think I do. So this is a different guy. Cool stuff. Any questions? Uh, okay, the case, the base case was a hundred dollars, but it's just the top glass, the four cotton on the bottom. And then I have to have the um, plastics, uh, cut, the cards and all that. So the, the case was a hundred, but then the plastic actually cost me two hundred, because it, it's, it's really hard in order to get people to actually do a good job. So, uh, like to get the laser cut plastic to be enormous. And they even didn't give me the color I asked for. But anyway, so that was uh, technically 300 for the case plus the parts and stuff. The printer, how much was the printer? 200. With a big spool of uh, black uh, PLA plastic. How long did it take to print out your bracelet? How long did it take yeah. to print out the bracelet? Uh, surprisingly, it takes a long time. Um, I think it was about an hour for one of the, the smallest ones. It was about only this tall, like let's say half an inch tall, and just the wrist size. Um, but it has a certain shape which makes it elastic, so you, you can actually fit it in. Um, and then after that, I started printing things that are much thinner, so I don't have to wait as long, but most prints take at least half an hour. But it's fascinating to watch these layers appear because the first layer looks like it's just printed, like it looks like ink almost. It's so thin and then it starts to just get thicker and thicker. It's, it's really amazing to watch. I, I could demonstrate it actually, but maybe I'll do it afterwards at the table over there because it's going to take a while. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's nice to watch. Very cool. So, Very cool. So, can you start and stop the print? Yeah, you can actually, uh, you can stop the print, you can even uh, stop it halfway, change the filament to a different color um, if you want. But it remembers the last spot, so, so it will just continue, because it's meant to deal with power failures and um, but it broken uh, filament. But how do you lock the piece that it's printing down? Because if it moves, wouldn't it be off? Well, um, it doesn't move. Like, uh, the first layer really sticks, but it is put a little bit of uh, paper glue there that is dry. Yeah. And then with the heat, uh, the plastic actually melts it a little bit and it sticks really good. And then to remove it, what you do is you, uh, you pull the, uh, that's like a glass plate or plexiglass. You just bend it a little bit and it cuts right out. But it, but it stays, it stays really, um, really well in that. Actually, you can see some of the, I don't know if you can really see yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Very good, thank you.
is kind of what our show is built on, you know, is people doing things like this, uh, way outside the box, although it does have a box. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this is, this is really uh, the, the kind of work that we love to see, <clears throat> and especially with these ancillary devices that you've got going here. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether, did you get a chance to talk to him about that? I can meet him tonight. About the Arduino? I talked past there on my own. Okay. All right. So, um, so I think our uh, our next presentation is uh, is when. What's our next presentation? Uh, we need to test before we're going to announce. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's say 30 minutes from now uh, we'll make it. We'll uh, announce as soon as we know. In about 30 minutes from now we'll do it again. Yeah. Then we'll know what we're presenting. Okay. About 30 minutes from now. Just type the word. 